think most of you probably know, we've had about over 10 years of conversations and planning and envisioning what that project could be, and how it could add vitality and make for a better looking, more active, uh, beautiful uh, Japantown district. And we now have this opportunity at hand to really realize this project. Because toward the end of the summer, a last critical piece came into place. Uh, and the last critical piece was a financing partner for the project. And so the developer and working with the community on the project. And we now have with Williams and Dame a financing partner company called Related, who you'll meet tonight, who's able to provide the money with Williams and Dave and make it all possible. So the good news is, we now have the opportunity to, to move forward. I think this has been long awaited. So what we want to do today is, to, is three things. There's just three parts to the agenda. The first part is, we want to share with you some recently completed research and data about the availability of parking in Japantown. And we know that this is a really important issue. So we actually invested some city dollars to hire a really great company called Hexacon, who specializes in parking and traffic and understanding. So they're here with us tonight. They're going to share this data with you. And then we want to get your reactions and answer questions. So that's the first part of the agenda. The second part of the agenda is we're going to have, and most of you now know Chris, from Williams and Dame is going to come and talk about how the courtyard project is going to be parked in a very responsible way, in a way that will not impact the district. And he's going to share with you some of the data that support that. And, and again, hear your reactions and answer your questions. So let's transition to the first section then. Uh, let's bring uh, Trisha Dudala up here. As we said, um, we know there's a lot of concern about parking, and there's a lot of different ways that we experience the Japantown district as ourselves or as a business. But we thought it was important to collect data and do research and put the facts on the table. And so that's what Trisha and Hexagon did. And we want to give them an opportunity to, to share um, what they learned. And so I think we'll let her go through the presentation, and then there'll be plenty of time for, for questions. Good evening, everybody. My name You're is You're going to need to really project. <laughs> oh, you've got a mic. Okay. Great. Is this working? Okay, trust it. Hello. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm Tricia Dudula with Hexagon Transportation Consultants, and we did the uh, parking analysis for the Japan Town Corporation Yard project. And I'm here to present the findings. Just to give you a background, so we did the uh, parking study for the Japantown Corporation Yard Redevelopment Project, which is a 5.3 acre vacant site and uh, proposed to contain 457 condominium units, up to 20,000 square feet of retail, and up to 50,000 square feet of community space. Now, the current uh, vacant site, it actually has a public parking lot. It, uh, with 61 spaces, uh, it's a city of San Jose paid parking lot. And in order to redevelop the site, uh, we would have, I mean, the city would have to re obviously remove the parking lot. So in order to express public concerns about the loss of parking, the staff committed to complete a parking study and present the findings. So what Hexagon did is we evaluated the current parking conditions uh, within about a quarter mile radius of the project site, which is about a quarter mile radius, uh, we chose that because that's a reasonable walking distance. And uh, we also studied the current parking utilization of the 61 uh, space parking lot on site. This is the study area. Um, you see the project site in the center and all the roadways that are highlighted in red to uh, 10th Street, and the east-west streets include Mission Street, Taylor Street, Jackson Street, and Empire Street. And based on the data that uh, we collected, uh, there are a total of 962 free parking spaces, 
eight designated loading zones with the potential to provide 20 parking spaces during non-business hours, 53 short-term uh, parking spaces, 214 meter parking spaces, and 189 restricted parking spaces, with a total of 1,438 spaces. And this is not including the 61 space parking lot on uh, the side, on the parking side. The parking counts were basically conducted during a typical weekday and a typical Saturday. And uh, they were counted on a Thursday, November 21st of last year and Saturday, November 23rd of last year. And the parking counts were conducted every hour between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. And um, this is this shows the results of uh, uh, the parking demand on a typical weekday, and this is inclusive of all parking: the free parking, the metered parking, restricted parking, uh, all all types of parking. So what we noticed is there are two different peaks during uh, during the time period that we collected. One occurs at noon, and the other in the evening at about 7:30. So the parking, basically, the demand for parking gradually increased from 8 a.m. in the morning and peaked at about 12 p.m. And then it decreased. There was a decline in parking. And then at about 3 p.m. onwards, uh, it started to increase again, peaking at about 7.30. And after that, it, the demand again starts to decline. So the peak parking demand was counted to be about 904 spaces. That's about 63% occupancy. So uh, there is still about 534 spaces still available. And this shows the parking data on a typical uh, Saturday. And on a sat for a Saturday, we found that the parking demand was about 8% higher than a typical weekday with a peak demand parking for 973 spaces, which is about 68% occupancy. So there was still about 465 spaces still available. Uh, due to the uh, constraints and logistics involved with the short-term parking, metered parking, etc., we, we looked at just the free parking where you can just park without any time how about now? So uh, we just looked at the free parking where you could just park without any time restrictions or without having to pay. And there are a total of 962 free parking spaces in the study area. And there was a peak parking demand of 617 spaces. There were about 617 spaces that were occupied. That calculates to about 64% occupancy. So there, there was still there were still 345 spaces still available. And this uh, shows the free parking uh, data uh, for a Saturday. And for a total of 962 free parking spaces, the peak parking demand was 674 spaces, which is about 70% occupancy. And there were still 288 spaces still available. We also looked at the current parking utilization of the 61 space public lot on the project side. And during a typical weekday, which was the, which was the, which was the Thursday that we counted, there were a total of, um, during the uh, total, I mean, yeah, there were 12 vehicles counted between noon and 2 p.m. That was the highest demand, basically. And during the rest of the day, there were eight or fewer vehicles parked on site. And on a Saturday, there were a maximum of 14 vehicles parked between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. And during the rest of the day, there were fewer than uh, 10 vehicles parked on the site. So basically, uh, the parking study concluded that the 61 space public lot is underutilized and the existing demand uh, for the public lot can be easily absorbed by other parking available in the area. And similarly, uh, for a total of 438 all types of parking, 
there was a typical, I mean, there was a total demand of 904 spaces on a weekday and 973 spaces on a Saturday. And for free parking, for a total of 962 parking spaces, there was a peak parking demand for 617 spaces on a weekday and 674 spaces on a Saturday. So we concluded that there was uh, sufficient uh, parking still available in the Japantown area. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Um, so what, what questions do you have? Let's start from the back. Well, that quarter mile from the corporation yard, is that a radius that is not a diameter, is that correct? That's a radius, that's right, that's a radius. So actually it's from Mission to Empire, it's the half a mile. It's a uh, study area, so it's about So it's between um, Mission Street and Empire Street. That's a north-south street, and the e uh, I mean, sorry, those are the east-west streets, and the north-south streets were between Third Street and Ninth Street. So that was that was the boundary of a study area. Yeah, but the distance between Mission and Empire is not a quarter mile. No, it's about an, it. It would be about half a mile. Half a mile. Yes. So a quarter mile. For an average walker, it was about five to six minute walk. So you're correct, if you were walking the full wingspan, it would be yeah, maybe a 10 to 12 minute walk. Basically, you would walk that distance, you yeah. walk it. Right. Also, did you include the Dubashi parking lot? Which one? The Dubashi parking lot. And where is that located? That's just north of the Soko Hardware Building. No. No. Nancy, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, we didn't include it because it isn't currently available for and why did you include the restricted parking? If it's restricted parking, the public can't park it. That's right. Um, I, uh, the restricted parking, um, it was not metered. This, I mean, this restricted, this particular parking lot, uh, I think it's on 9th Street between Taylor and um, Mission. And we did, um, we were under the impression that initially it was free parking, but we realized that it was restricted parking. But since we already counted the data, we included that. But it only is a conservative estimate. But it's a conservative estimate though. Because we did not include that under free parking. We did not include that under free parking. We, we just showed you the results of the free parking as well. And that does not come under free parking. So with the free parking, the utilization went up to approach 70%. Yes, 70%. You know, she's using this number of 1,400 plus parking spaces available, in which she's including restricted parking. Yes, so the but number of parking spaces actually available is not 1,400. So let, let's, 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 let's confirm that, because I, I think what you did was you took a second pass at it. Yes. And then you said, of the free spaces, which, is, which are That's how right. many, not 1,400, yes. or something less. 900 or 960. So 900 are free, and 1,400 is in all the spots. But for percentages of 64%, 68% included all parking. Yeah, so let's, let's show that. Just, right. I think you're making a really important point, so let's just clarify that. So she did it, she did it two ways. Yes, the 1438 did include the restrictive parking, only, uh, but even if you remove that restrictive parking, we also included the demand that was the highest demand that the restrictive parking so let's, had. Let's see that slide. The, uh, the demand show, yeah. for, uh, I don't have the, uh, the data, I don't have the slide here for each uh, parking type. I only did, we only did the free parking separately. So let's look for the free one. Yeah. So I think that's what matters. But I can, I can give you the data uh, right after my presentation. I have the data with me, the survey data. So I can tell you exactly how many were counted in the restricted parking. Okay, so here, this is the slide which shows the 962 free parking spaces and a peak parking demand 
674, or 7% of the free ones were being used. So that means 30% of the free ones were not being used. Does that answer your question? But <laughs> she did it two ways. So the dates that you selected were in November? Yes, that's right. Yes, Thanksgiving. Was that the week before Thanksgiving? Um, it was. It was the week before Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, question? Our, our business really drops off in November because everybody's getting ready to get the property tax. So, after the after tax season, which is May. And that's when our business month is really. So I mean, if if you were, you know, I know you didn't pick the number day, but I mean logistically our numbers are just really poor after after Halloween and through Christmas. Because everything goes to the mall. Okay. So the week you pick could be very long if you pick this week before things so it's not yeah. Uh, does the data that you gather to allow you to build uh, aggregate it in a way so you can see like a, a heat map, like for example, 95% uh, of free spaces were found on the perimeter or uh, a specific spot, something like that? Yes, we didn't necessarily draw a graphic that shows that, but based on the data that we collected, right around the project site, yes, there's, uh, the parking is pretty much full. But as you go further from the project site, but within the quarter mile radius, there is still parking available. Some of the issue on the parking is when Rome comes in and Williams and Dane comes in, some of these people are gonna be coming home now. There's not enough parking for them because there's only 1.39 parking spaces at Williams and Dane per unit. So if they have two people living there, some people are gonna be parking on the street. And the fear for the business association is that they're gonna be parking in front of their businesses and preventing you know, patrons to come to their business and that it will affect those businesses. Now, you're talking about these times right now, but those two units haven't come in yet. That impact is what we are talking about, the impact of those two residential areas the other thing that you cannot forget, because I want the city to think about the right hand from the city departments and the left hand. You've approved things like the restaurant of Wenzel. We're so happy that they're coming in and they're the new noodle place. But there's no accommodation for any parking for them. They're grandfathered in because that building's over 100 years old and there's no parking for them, right? So now you have to understand, some of us are thinking, these businesses are brand new businesses. They're like little babies. The little babies, you can't show them out without having enough parking spaces for them. You know, the little babies are important because they need five years to grow and hopefully be able to stay and develop and really, you know, help Japantown. But if we choke them out and there's no parking for them, then, then they may die. And that's a concern for us. It's a strong concern. And one of the other things that we need to think about is, you know, uh, the city always approves per business that comes in, like I'm in Morido Village. If, if a restaurant comes in, there's X amount of parking spaces that have to be around for that restaurant to come in. There's no accommodation for when's out at all. Now, I don't know what other businesses are around, but I think the city needs to think about how many businesses are there? Your requirements for us to have, for us to be able to come in and start a new business, we need X amount of parking spaces. Do we have those X amount of parking spaces? I do not believe we do. And that's based on city law. Do we have the parking space? Count every one of the businesses. Okay, this business needs 20 parking spaces. This one needs 10, this one needs 30. Figure it out and tell me truly do we have enough for the businesses? And then, if now the residential people come in, and especially in the evening, start parking and taking up parking spaces, some of the restaurants are really going to be severely impacted. Now, I have a... a so, so, I just want to put a pin in that. You've got two thoughts here. Okay. okay. Good, right. So, the first one, I'm just going to park right here, so to speak, because we're going to go to that next. So, the issue of 
is the courtyard project going to have sufficient parking for the residents, for their visitors, and for the retail that's there? So we want to again share with you the data about what the plan is and why we think it will not impact the broader area. Chris is going to do that next. So the second issue you raised, which is also a really important one, has to do with parking for the businesses, including the new businesses. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why we invested in doing this study, because the other neighborhood business districts in the city of San Jose, they tend to look at like, how much parking is in the district in that five or five plus um, minute walk. And so one answer to that is you guys are really lucky because you've got 900 plus free spaces within this area. And so that is going to be helpful for the, for the businesses that are here because they can, people can park for free uh, either in front if it's available or if not, a few minutes walk away. But, but you guys are keeping floating over this. I mean, I'm coming in strong because it's really important to us. We want the survival of Japantown. The survival of Japantown includes the survival of businesses. And if you don't have the business to survive, this Japantown may disappear like the, all the other Japantowns across the United States. There are 100 so much Japantowns, we only have three left. We are the smallest one. We need to think about that. And, and you're saying 962 free parking spaces. I would like the city to go back and evaluate every business is there, that there. How many businesses are there? What are the requirements that the city makes on us of the amount of parking spaces we need to really be able to flourish as a business? Do those 962 spaces, are there enough? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that right. answer is That's an important good. question, right? Because what's so great now is Japan has a lot of thriving businesses, so we need to keep that going and not do anything. Okay, so make sure I get around. Thank you. Yes. You're next. <laughs> Qu question. We take question, but we're going to have more discussion after we let Chris get through this section. So, to, in addition to what Carol said about the study period, I was concerned that Sunday was not going to happen. Yeah. Good Sunday point. at 10 o'clock. Good point. A lot of churches in our neighborhood if you did your study. So if you come at 10 o'clock, you cannot find a so, so we agree. And that's why we are doing a Sunday and, study that's and very second, correct. Secondly, with what she was talking about existing businesses, we do have one of the oldest properties in Japan now that we would like to develop. And if we were to do that, that would cre again create a higher demand for parking. And we would be grandfathered in because we have, it's always been retail, it's just that currently with the URM, it's not. So that's something that hasn't been considered in the study, but she mentioned businesses that may not exist now, but could come about with, with, in the existing old Yeah, okay, you want to make sure you have the parking. But that's yeah. not, you can understand yeah. that, but that would affect. Yeah. And when I hear these existing spaces, let's not all forget that that's, our neighbor, that's in front of our houses. Those of us who live between Mission and Taylor, envision living in San Francisco in your whole front yard. If your friends come to visit, they cannot park in front of your home. So that's what we're talking about. If you happen to be a resident in Japantown, your how you view how you're living now won't be the same if we're going to maximize all the parking spaces because they're talking about parking in front of our homes. Let me ask Nancy to address the first issue you raised, what, which was, what about Sundays? Because we know there's a lot of a lot of church going here on Sunday, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. thank you for mentioning that. So we realize, basically, we need to do Sundays. I think, in general, when we work with Hexagon, many of the businesses aren't super active on Sunday, so that's why normally you pick Saturday up as your weekend. So we, tr we are trying, we will do Sunday. We tried to do Sunday last week, and of course it was the um, marathon. So that would have worked. So we will look to this weekend. Um, you won't be able to find parking. <laughs> good. That would be good for you. And I also thought it was really important yeah, what you raised here about the restricted parking. So I just quickly, pardon any errors, but I, I went back and redid the math. So if you subtract 189 restricted spaces from the door to uh, actually, it bumps it. It, it. In the numbers, it doesn't. So, so it takes it to 69% park on weekdays. And 
about getting my cup for every lunch I come out. And it takes to 74% on the weekends. So that's the, the differential. But a good point, and I think we should be more conservative in the numbers, so thank you for bringing it here. Yeah, yeah, this is Mr. Kruger says, I would think, <coughs> excuse me, 60% of the parking spaces, the free parking spaces counted, are in residential areas. And that, that is a terrible burden for a homeowner to bear. And as far as parking from their house, no access to friends, family. I would say, because there is not that much parking in Japantown proper, you're going out two blocks into the neighborhoods to find your, your parking space. You're eliminating loading zones to get parking spaces. Well, what, what, at the store, where are they going to deliver it? The loading zone. So, a quick note on that, and Trish may want to comment. We were, and then other folks have been in the room thinking about it. This was put under the conversation of a number of those loading zones aren't necessarily used. They're, they're there historically. So, it's the question where can we free up spaces? And then it was also, is there a flexibility that after business hours? Because it's you know, one of the issues that we're raising is as we grow and as we get more dense, which be all the whole of the city, is, right? These are issues that we'll be solving together that go well beyond this this project, right? So that's sort of the, some of the things that are happening in, in neighborhoods throughout, well, the South Bay, but certainly in San Jose. So, so those are the kinds of things we wanted to surface and raise. And the, the parking spaces in front of homes are, are I totally get you. Uh, convenience and they are also public so they carry a dual role. Sure. Right. Okay, what is so. unique about our neighborhood Japan town with families living close to this area. Yes. And you're putting a burden on us residents, I feel, on the residents, making it less attractive to live here. You know, as it is most a lot of people would rather move out from the inner city. So we will at the we will at the third section. I'm going to move us along yes. so we get Thank through you. everything, and you get to see the results of the Giants game. So we will talk <laughs> about get your ideas about other solutions in the third part. So I'm just going to ask on this side of the house, are there two quick questions or comments? Well, I was sir? just going to say I'm a resident of Fantown, Fifth Street, and residential area, and I actually don't have any problem with it. Don't curse this district to go to, and I don't see this parking issue being a burden at all. I mean, that's just our opinion on this part of Jackson Street. But I, I don't see it as a problem. We, we really don't have that problem. Yes, on Sunday mornings, there's a number of churches that do fill up the streets, but pretty much the rest of the time, you can always find parking for either yourself or red, uh, visitors within the block or so. And it's a great trade-off to have this walkable great area right to go to. So that's I know me and many other people that are on that side of it are, that's what we believe that it's, it's a great place. But you have to understand high density, like I'm in, I live in Mariana Square. My office is in Grider Village. Already around Mariani Square, we can't, by 4.30, 3.30, 4.30, we can't park around our own complex. We now have to walk a block or two already. So we're in high density where we're located. He's in the lower density. But what we're saying is when the two larger density things come in, it's going to start okay. really impacting. I, I so there concerned. is impact. But let's, let's get, I want to get to that. I want to talk about this potential project uh, and, and how it's going to be approached from parking. So Chris, sure. let's take it away. Um, uh, so Chris Longinetti. I'm with Lane and Dave. You need to use a microphone. Uh, do I need a microphone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping to do that. Sorry, it's your microphone. Um, so uh, my name is Chris Longinetti. I'm with Lane and Dane. I've met many of you. Um, what I want to talk about was, was our specific project and as it relates to parking. Saturday, obviously, we'll talk a little bit more about the project specific. Um, but what I really wanted to do was focus on how we're looking at, at parking and how we've addressed it in our development. Um, <clears throat> we have very simple development goals. Uh, first and foremost, we want to create an attractive, comfortable walking environment around and through the development that activates the pedestrian realm. And in our company, we talk about the first 30 feet. We do the first 30 feet of the development right, 
make sure that it, it is reflective of the community, that it creates a community, um, that we create a unique sense of place, we recognize the culture and the history of the site and the community, um, and our building reflects that. We try to make it reflect that. We also think it's really important to revitalize what is the formal industrial site that lays the heart of Japantown. Right? Um, I don't think anyone in this room, their opinions on parking notwithstanding, would like to see that as a service lot. It's just not added into the community. It doesn't, it doesn't enhance the community. Um, so, so what do we do? We look to provide a project that's going to strengthen Japantown, the business environment, by providing a new, vibrant customer base at the doorstep of all of these businesses in Japantown. Um, and we also would like to continue the retail presence and continue it down Jackson Street, right, starting with the corner of Jackson and Sixth. But first and foremost, we also want to make sure that we ensure the development is responsibly parked and that all of our users are accommodated on site. And the last thing we want to do is have our projects spill out into the community, particularly along Jackson Street, and right, make sure that everything is self-contained on the site. So parking impacts development and, and urban design. I, I, I teach a class at Portland State University, a bunch of wide-eyed young guys that all want to be developers, and they want to design buildings. And I say, great, let's talk about parking. Because parking is always at the root of any development. So there's three ways you can approach parking. Right? Surface parking. Um, surface parking is really a low density solution. It's cheap, it's easy to do, right? but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not appropriate in an urban setting. Um, it creates barriers to the pedestrian environment by just creating giant open fields. Right? It's not warm, it's not, it's not inviting, right? it doesn't bring people off the street and onto the site, it doesn't bring people from the site off of their development and into the community. Um, and in its worst instances, it can be unsafe and uncomfortable. Please note the well-positioned barbed wire <laughs> to make this look extremely foreboding. But, but the reality is, right, the way that the, the corporation yard is today, and if it is just a, ultimately just a surface lot, it's not drawing you into the community. Right? It's a barrier to walk around or through. It's just, it's not inviting. It's not creating a sense of place. And for the site located where it is, right, it's, surface parking is just not appropriate. So then the alternatives are structure parking. Right, above grade parking. Um, this is more appropriate for an urban environment. Uh, it can, it's appropriate in, a, in an area that is trying to create more density. Um, but it needs to be properly treated at the ground level. Right? It, needs to, it needs to not be so foreboding or invasive that, again, it takes away from the first 30 feet of development. Right? It takes away from what the community is interacting with when it comes to interacting with the development. Um, but it's costly. Right? I mean, in and of itself, uh, structured parking being anywhere between 25 and what well, we say now 35,000 in space. Um, and in environments like San Jose, where people don't pay for parking, right? it, it doesn't generate income. Right? So it can't pay for itself. Um, and this is a standard parking garage. Right? I mean, this is above grade parking. Um, but you can see this, this sort of hasn't been treated very well as far as how does it interact with the how does it interact with, with the neighborhoods. It's just very foreboding. And some of our developments that are in downtown LA, right, this is above grade parking, but yet it's surrounded by retail. It is um, sort of within the, the structure itself, but you wouldn't necessarily know that there's sort of parking behind it. Right? It's treated appropriately for the community. Um, you know the last way that, that parking gets handled, uh, and particularly in urban design settings, is, is below grade parking. Right? Same idea as structured parking, except it's subterranean, right? below grade. A little bit easier uh, with regards to interaction with the community because most of it happens underground. Right? It's usually sort of a ramp that goes down. Um, you usually only see the garage entrance from the street. But this is associated with very high density projects. It's extremely expensive. Once you start digging, um, it gets very expensive, and so the cost of these types of parking is forty to fifty thousand dollars a space. Generally, not used in environments that don't charge for parking. Um, but again, we think that it deserves consideration with regards to with regards to Japan. Um, this is a project uh, in Portland Pearl District, done by our group um, with with below grade parking. 
So when we look at the site, right, we want to make sure that we're being appropriate with regards to starting with physical characteristics as we look at, at, at urban design. What do we see? Right? The project's in the heart of Japan now. Um, it's the eastern angle. has the potential to be the eastern anchor for Jackson Street retail. Uh, we see it as a transit-oriented site. Right? It's very, very big in, in, in Portland, right? transit-oriented developments. And we look at this as a transit-oriented development. It's a half mile from the Japantown VTA station. Um, it'll be two miles from the new BART station, the very acid station where it opens. Very connected by bike paths, right? Very connected by, by transportation. Um, it's also really big, right? It's a, it's a very, very big site. So those are the physical characteristics. Then we look to the neighborhood characteristics, right? What do we see in the neighborhood? What draws Williams and Dame and, and, what, we, and what draws related is that this is a vibrant neighborhood. Right? There are developers that spend a lot of time trying to create the type of neighborhood that exists in Japantown today. Vibrant retail, vibrant restaurants, right? Sort of walkable neighborhoods. Things where you can get all of your errands done right, within a four block area. Um, Multi-generational neighborhood with a really strong sense of history and tradition. Right? I would also say that it also has a perfect match of tradition, and I also think that it's 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 fairly pioneering, or at least uh, um, has a lot of vibrancy with regards to some of the new retail that's coming in, the way that it's been accepted by the community. Um, and again, this, it's big, right? This is also sort of in the neighborhood context. This site is very, very big, and it needs to be broken down to invite pedestrians into the site. So, what's our approach given those dynamics? Well. As we said, the site needs to be fully parked. Right? It needs to park itself on site with regards to residential and retail. Um, the cost needs to be carried by private development. There's neither, there's neither city subsidy nor the ability to charge people for parking. Right? The reality of development in California today is that the RDA is gone. Right? The, 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 the days of significant investment by municipalities doesn't exist in this environment. Right? We look at Morado Village. Um, 50% of the development costs came from the RDA. Right? That's not available to us today. It changes what we can build, what we can afford to build. Um, and so we look at some combination of above grade or a combination of above and below grade parking as being appropriate in the solution for the site. We'll get into more of this on Saturday, but this is our general site plan. Um, we talked about trying to break up the site. Right, and that's what we've tried to do is break up the site into thirds, to try to create a site that is accessible, that is of a size that's, a, that's appropriate for the neighborhood, right? and also treats this really, really long block as three separate block blocks to invite pedestrian traffic and, and flow through the neighborhoods. Right? We look at the, at the sort of main entrance to our site on 6th and Jackson, right? That's, that's the area that's labeled there as the activity node, right? That's the eastern anchor for the retail. Natural retail accumulates down Jackson Street. We'd like to bring it down 6th Street, right? And we'd like to connect it through, right, through the center of the site over to 7th and beyond. Right? One of the things that I've noticed is right, getting, to the, getting to the park that's across Taylor Street over by 7th right, is, is not really easy from Jackson Street today. Going through the, you can't go through the corporate yard, right? It's not a very pleasant walk through. But the idea being is, is that a development that's done right that invites pedestrians through right, now opens up other areas of the neighborhood where people don't normally flow, right, where people don't normally walk. Um, so it's very important for us to talk about sort of you know, the pedestrian core. All right, that's great, but we want to just talk about parking. Right? So <clears throat> how do developers look at parking? Right? Quite frankly, developers look at parking and say, how much do we have to build? And particularly in, in environments where you can't charge for parking. So we look at the zoning code. Um, many cities, including Portland, where I'm from, have parking maximums, the maximum amount of parking that you can generate. So they do it for traffic management and urban design goals, um, and then the onus is on us as the developer to determine what's appropriate. What will our tenants demand? What will our tenants use? What do we need to provide to make the place a, a, a pleasant place to live for people? And, and ultimately, what can be financed? San Jose is the opposite, right? San Jose has minimum parking requirements. 
um, residential retail minimums. Now, there's the ability uh, to reduce that by right for transportation alternatives, transportation demand reduction initiatives, um, location near transit, bike parking, things along those lines. Um, but the problem with minimums as we see it, right, is minimums result in overbuilding, right? People overbuild parking. And it is money that, it's money and space that's used for parking that should be put into the development of the, of the property, right? Bringing down the, reducing parking, bringing down the scale of projects, investing in things in the property as opposed to just investing in the property. Um, we were here about 18 months ago uh, in a neighborhood meeting, um, and what we had proposed was a 600 unit project that had about 600 parking spaces. Right? We were parked at about one, we were about parking one for, per unit. Um, we were looking at, at, at zoning allowing us to do that, and we were confident that zoning would allow us to do that. If we included things such as car share, subsidized transit passes, right, telecommunication centers, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood services, um, we believe that zoning would allow us to do that. But we took a step back, we heard what the community had said to us, um, and, and we thought it deserved a little bit of, of research on our part and to sort of rescale the property. So in 2013, uh, so sorry, so we looked at what is being used in, in Santa Clara. There's a 2010 VTA report um, that reviewed development of parking utilization within a half mile of VTA stations. Right? It looked at properties that we consider comparable properties. They were over 80 units in size, uh, and they were over 90% occupied. And what the VTA did was do a parking survey and understand how much parking is actually used right, compared to what the code required when those properties were developed. Right? So these were some of the sites they looked at. Uh, everywhere from Mountain View, Fair Oaks, um, a lot in the downtown area. Uh, and then far, uh, as far south as Almaden. Right? There was 12 properties total uh, that they'd identified as comparable properties, right? and this is what they ended up seeing. These 12 properties had over 9,700 total spaces that were developed. Um, of those, about 7,200 were used, right? providing for about 22% vacancy. Right? The average occupied spaces per unit for these properties, which we consider like kind, and quite frankly, a number of them that don't have the infrastructure, uh, the public infrastructure available that Japantown has around it, which is about 1.3 spaces per unit. Um, okay, well, so that's one end of it, right? What are, what's sort of being used? And then we also want to look at zoning, right? So what, what does zoning say? Well, <clears throat> You can see the ratios of the, the units that are parking spaces that are required per zoning um, for studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three, and three bedrooms. Comes out to about 1.4 spaces per unit. Right? Based on our development size today, which we think is about 457 units, um, the, the parking ratio that we would provide, have to provide on site would be about 637 spaces for uh, the residents. And then for a 19,500 square feet of retail, uh, we would be required to provide about 49 spaces. So that's what, that's what would be required per zoning. So let's go back to the site. What do we think is the right amount for the site? Well, <clears throat> we're gonna provide alternative transportation options, right? The site will have car share. Um, and there's a UC study that's available on the desk out front that discusses car share and how that really does reduce people's car ownership. Um, subsidized transit passes, right? a high quality pedestrian environment, is super important to us. Um, covered and secured bike parking and then access to the, to the BTA line. Right? So our conclusion is, is that a parking ratio of 1.25 or 1.3 per unit is supportable and it would be allowed by code. But we've heard the, we've, we've heard the community. Right? Um, they want more than that. And so what we're looking at here is, is with our property of around 450 residential units, or around 20,000 square feet of retail, right, the site limitation is about 700 spaces. Right? The site, if built for maximum parking that, that we feel could be supported in the development, would be about 700 spaces. Um, so we can meet code without any reductions. Um, we'll, we'll also incorporate all of the urban design concepts that we think reduce car usage. Right? 
And ultimately, we won't have any financial support from the city, right? This is a standalone development project. <clears throat> so where does that leave us, right? Well, we think the appropriate parking is somewhere in the zone. Right? Based, on the, based on the VTA, right? It says a, a property of our size should have about 650 spaces. Right? Based on zoning, um, it says that a property our size should have about 690 spaces. And so, right, if you ask me today, I think we should be on the lower end of that zone, on the lower end of that range. Um, but we understand that the community wants us to be at the higher end of this range. And uh, what we feel is, is that the site, as we would build it, right, could, accommodate, could accommodate us being on the higher end of this range. Right? We still would like to be in front of the community as we go through this process, as we go through the tracks, the traffic meetings, as we go through the protected intersection meetings, right, and further define and refine where this parking ratio is, um, but the site could accommodate high end of this range. So what are our conclusions? Um, our residential spaces will be available to the residents and their visitors. The range of parking that we showed is more than enough in capacity based on actual data for demand of parking in similar projects in the South Bay, right, using like kind comparisons. The retail spaces are publicly accessible. Um, whether they're free or not, obviously, are going to depend on the, the ultimate retail leases that we sign. Uh, but again, the site would be self-supporting. Um, we haven't talked about the CCA because our, our group's not developing that. Um, but uh, in conversations with the city and in conversations with the CCA, the CCA will be, uh, as it's further defined and designed, it also will be responsibly parked. So understanding that, that parking is sensitive to this community as with all communities. This is, this is how we propose addressing it on our site so that we're self-contained. So that was a, a good, a good description. Of, how, the, of Yeah, absolutely. So it's a um, it's a public report. Uh, it's available online from the VTA. I, I've um, provided a copy to the city, and I think they can circulate it. But it, it has who those twelve properties are. There's also um, there's another group, uh, and I, I I will also circulate it. But they did a smaller set subset. Um, it included properties uh, such as Vendome and a couple of the other ones in the in the neighborhood. Their parking ratio was a little bit lower. It was about 1.2 per unit, um, but it was a, it was a much smaller sample. It was probably four properties, five properties. But yeah, absolutely. How can we get the study out? We'll here? print it out for Saturday. We'll bring it Saturday. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, is, is there uh, any trend analysis? Like, uh, let's say there's data from 2008, 2010, 2012, 2013. How many free parking spaces were available? Uh, let's say. Uh, it was uh, 600 in 2008, uh, 400 in uh, 2010, and then 200 in 2012. Uh, I mean, it's not a secret that the population is growing, yeah. and this area is developing. There are new developments on the 6th, on 7th Street, on the 10th Street, and uh, um, Bart is going to bring more population uh, uh, to this area. This is the first part of the question. If there is any data showing the trend, and how is it going to continue likely in the next the second part, maybe of the question is, let's say you are a resident of uh, Japan town and you're looking forward uh, uh, like a long term. Uh, if I had a, like, you, you mentioned that there's a 40,000, 50,000 uh, per, per parking space, so the cost to build a parking. Let's say I had 5 million in my pocket. Would you, uh, would you be willing to build underground parking uh, and that, uh, uh, development uh, for, for 100 uh, spaces. So if, if you have $5 million in your pocket, we should talk after <laughs> uh, this. So let me, let me sort of go through the first part of your question and then the second part. Um, so with regards to the first part, <clears throat> let me just be clear that the, the numbers that we're talking about have to do with individual properties that are developed and the residents that live there. So. Uh, what it looked at was those are those are finite in number, right? There's, there's only so many there's only so many apartment units in those properties. So whether it was 2008 or 2011, um, the properties are 90% occupied or more. 
so they were they were full, right? It's just sort of full capacity. It didn't look at it didn't look at neighborhood parking. It only looked at the the, uh, the dedicated on-site parking for those properties, right? And so the ratios for that was sort of one two five to one three. Yeah. Did those studies look at the spillover into the neighborhood, or just the on-site parking for that? So the report, the report discusses that, right? And because um, I know at Bend, though, they have the on-site parking. Yeah. Right there. A lot of folks who don't have the on-site parking park in the surrounding yeah. area. So, so the way that the study approached that was they said that once parking lots get to about 85% occupancy, the perception is that they're full, right? And then there's and then there's spillover, right? And so. Um, given that the occupancies they determined never reached greater than 80 percent, right, they just made the they made the determination, right, that the that there was plenty of capacity on site and that people that lived there were parking on site. But they didn't study to see if it did. Well, there was so it's it's really difficult, right? There's they they just they counted parking spaces, right, as opposed to having individual tenants register where they're parking. Right? Because at them though, it's a commercial area, so you don't sure. have residents. Parking. So when we see cars in the evening. You, 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 the conclusion is it's from the the Bendo project sure. because there's, it's all commercial. Sure. Yeah. And and that's just been my observation living in the neighborhood and seeing how how that project yeah, no, is understood. Still. Understood. Mm -hmm. I have a question on how um, So my question is, did you look at like decoupling the parking? You know, so that people who are more uh, have more of a mindset that they're in an urban environment, um, maybe they don't want a parking space associated with their unit, and therefore they would waive that versus you know other people who would want it and would be willing to pay for it. Did you think? Yeah. So, um, so in developing apartments, um, it's not necessarily the same as the condominiums where you buy a condominium and then you get assigned parking, right? So usually it will be, um, quite frankly, with, with the apartments generally, it's sort of one space per, it's one space per unit, um, and if, up to like two bedroom units. And if you want an extra unit, you have to sort of buy a, a parking pass, right? So um, it's open parking, right? It's not, it wouldn't be assigned. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different dynamic than, than the condominiums. Okay, and I for the general group, I, I do have a concern because the developer, developer will be bearing the cost of, you know, coming up with the parking. I'm, I'm worried that then some of the amenities that the community might see or the, to the, to the development might be, you know, go away or be compromised. Yeah. Um, I think you guys do great work, but I, I am really concerned that this is a, you know, beautiful development and no, there's no. art in it. So I agree, right? No, I agree, um, and that's why that's why I'm saying that there's there's capacity on the site for about 700 cars, right? Well, we'd like to educate the community and convince the community that that doesn't need 700 parking spaces, right? Because I agree with you, right? Those are resources that can be put elsewhere. Yes, sir. And then let's um, go to the group conversation. If we can, do you still want to do that? Do the small group conversation? Let's think about that. I'll take your comments. Uh, a couple of questions. Will the patrons of the retail be able to park in your parking or will they be parking within the neighborhood? So as, as the development plan is now, there's 50 spaces that are that are public open for the retail. And how many retail spaces are you planning? That's so it's, it's 50 retail fifty retail parking spaces and there's about sixteen uh, sorry, nineteen thousand five hundred square feet of retail. And will the public be, have access to your parking for the all these extra parking spaces you anticipate? For the, for the residential parking spaces, uh, those would not be publicly accessed. Thank you. I'm just curious to understand, you know, in your studios and in your one bedrooms, yeah. typically, how many people stay in a studio in a one bedroom? Is it, you know, what is the average number? Like, you know, is it two people, one person every time? This is only 1.25, you, yeah. you know, you know, but if, if there's more people than that, you know, is that really considered? I mean, is it really only, you know, 25% have two people? I find that hard to believe. Yeah, I would think that more than that. 
would be staying in a, a, a studio in a one bedroom. Right. What are the facts on that? What's, what's nice about a development of our size mm -hmm. is that the numbers get big enough, the number of units get big enough that the, the population or tenants per, you know, type, towards type sort of goes towards the mean, right? So we feel that what you're gonna see as far as cars per unit is gonna be very, very, is gonna be below what the, what the root zoning is. Right? Because you're gonna have studio, you're gonna have a number of studios that are just gonna be one person, right? So, all, and they're allocated about 1.25 spaces, right? So there's overflow. Yeah, right. We just feel yeah. so. So I would say so. The answer to your question is is that I think that I you know the data that we look at, the experience that we have as a developer, um, particularly in, in sort of areas that are not suburban, right? We feel this is adequate. This is this should be reflective of the car use. Is there a way you can answer it the other way, like roughly what share of people studios you? in your experience have only one person? Or no, I don't. No, I don't. I mean, I can. Yeah. Use, we could probably. We can. We I could probably find look that. at that. Yeah. But that's how these numbers are come up. That's how they come up with this. Yeah. You know, being here representing West the United Methodist Church, I, I do want to say this. You know, it's it's great to hear that you know we have 900 and something free parking spaces in a you know certain radius, quarter mile radius of of uh, Japantown. Um, but at the same time, you know, as I think about the Buddhist temple and West the United Methodist Church. We have probably the largest parking, private parking areas in Japantown. Um, and I would imagine a lot of those free parking spaces are on the perimeters of that radius that we're talking about. Uh, what we find at Wesley, and I'm sure at the Buddhist uh, temple as well, is that a lot of folks treat our visitors to Japantown, treat our parking lots as public parking spaces. So um, there's a lot of folks. Uh, during the week and on the weekends that are parking in, in our church parking lot that really are not parking in those <laughs> far out areas of the, where the free parking yeah. spaces are. And, and it's a struggle for us. How do you feel really that? Yeah. As much as, you know, I, I, I certainly want to see, you know, that corp corporation yard uh, develop. I, I really want to see a home for San Jose Taiko. Um, but the parking issue is, is a big concern for us, especially, uh, Acknowledging that many of the greatest percentage of our congregation, I'm sure this is at the Buddhist temple as well, are the Nisei's, the, the older generation seniors. And so it's much harder for them. Okay, let me, let's turn the program over to Howard and Lisa. We're going to facilitate the session. Thank you. 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 So I'm Lisa with San Jose Tyco, and um, we were going to break out into small groups and then talk about what we liked or, dis or you know, didn't like about what was presented here today, um, and then also go on to what we, like brainstorm some solutions from the community, like based on what we've heard and just come up with some other solutions, like maybe it's figuring out how we can assist churches, church parking lots in moderating who's parking there, you know, ideas like that. Um, but I'm just wondering because there's, only this many people, I don't know if you want it more uh, beneficial for you to stay in the larger group and just pose questions. Okay, so once again, as our discussion has already proven, we have a split opinion. I mean, there's different. So how many people would prefer to break out into smaller groups? Please raise your hands. I think you're going to have better participation. I mean, some people, like some of us, will speak out, but there are many that will not. If you break into a smaller group, they'll speak up then, allow them to speak that up. That was the idea, but I just want to make sure that... I would, I would even suggest that we continue the Q&A, because I'm not sure if anybody else okay. Because if we get into smaller groups, we're just going to bitch about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would rather get the answers to our speculation from the horse's mouth. So I would recommend going on the Q&A. I kind of work with the developers and say that since we're talking about the elderly folks that I can get behind a, a project with less parking if your target renters were the elderly because they're prone would be the walking environment they don't need the car as much and so if we were to target the elderly for this project then I could totally see how the parking requirements are less 
So just to kind of, that would be fit, fit under the brainstorming section, mm -hmm. but that's totally separate from Todd's point of still wanting to ask questions. I think uh, I would go with Todd because if, if we break in into uh, small groups, there are no answers in those small groups. We would have to come to the city with the developer for answers. Come by link, uh, so I, don't see I, I would assume that they would be floating um, with this group size group. I think we'd only be doing three groups, maybe. Um, so I would assume they would be floating. I know when we did this about 18 months ago, we, we did have multiple suggestions. We had a whole poster board, you know, but we really didn't get the answers afterwards. Okay. There was no follow up. So, I mean, I mean, no dig on yeah. anybody, but yeah. yeah. You know. I think <clears throat> what this gentleman said is. If we break into the groups and we brainstorm, will those ideas then be given to the city of William and Danes as a part of? So let me, let me address both of these because, um, so uh, we have extensive notes on those roundtables. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the site redesign and what we've talked about as far as bringing down the site, we're based on that. Um, the number one issue for a lot of those roundtables was parking, which is why we thought if the city's gonna have a conversation about parking, let's sort of join that as far as the, so uh, on Saturday's meeting, right, the, the remainder of those things that are non-parking related, we'll talk about on that, you know, with regards to the, the let's go to the site. Um, so I would expect like the same thing that would happen here, here, sort of, you know, feedback that comes back as it relates to things that the city needs to look into, as it relates to things that development look into, you know, certainly would feedback to us. So I think also there's things that maybe you as a community can look into and that you have ideas and sort of empower to pursue amongst yourself. Well, are you writing down some of the ideas we're asking yes. question answers to? So like for business, you know, and type of business, how much parking is required for each of those businesses? I would love to know that. I would love to know the total of how many parking spaces are necessary for each of those businesses to survive based on city standards. That's all I'm asking, city standards. And it would be nice to have that department here be able to tell us that so that we know logically, okay, we have enough parking spaces for those businesses, okay? But I'm not real clear and I don't feel real, real comfortable with that. I mean, I do want to tell you, I love that Williams and Dave is coming in. I love the project. I love that you're going to try to make it beautiful and everything. We're, we're just, Right now, we're just trying to protect Japantown, and, and, and it's nothing against you, Chris. We love you, Chris. We love that, you know, uh, uh, the project is coming in. We're just really concerned about the parking, and we're concerned about the survival of Japantown. Again, if the businesses die, Japantown dies. That's what happened with all the other Japantowns. You I'm can't sorry, live with just a church or with just, you know, community organization. I'm just going to, I think, um, so I think they've been recorded. I definitely recorded the questions that weren't answered or weren't able to be answered here. And that would be the point. Uh, I mean, we would continue that if we were to do breakout or continue in a large group discussion. Um, but I think part of possible, I mean, you know, just continuing the discussion is really just identifying that we have diverse perspectives even within the community. There are some people who don't mind walking and don't mind people parking in front of their houses. And there's other people who are really concerned. I mean, like anything, right? We're not going to come to consensus. Um, I don't think anybody's saying businesses are not important, but I, I think in a smaller group when everybody's speaking up, we might hear more of those voices and get an idea of the pulse of the overall feeling of Japantown um, versus the people who are more comfortable being vocal. Um, that, I think that was the reason why we wanted to do breakout both here tonight as well as on Saturday to kind of get the scope of what Japantown is doing. Actually, uh, mind uh, walking or do not mind walking is, is one aspect there is another psychological aspect is that there is an uncertainty whether you are going to find a parking space or not going to find a parking space. If you see that there is P parking space go this direction, you you are following it. If you don't, you, you go to the restaurant, no parking available. You go to that P side, okay. right? But in this situation, where do you go? You go north, south, east, west, where? And is there a guarantee that you are going to find? So I go for lunch. Uh, how long I'm going to look for a parking space to uh, yeah, and then walk there and to the restaurant, have lunch, and then walk back and come back to work. So, uh, knowing this, uh, would I suggest, let's go to Japan for lunch. 
oh no, there's no parking space available there at this time. Let's go to, I don't know, uh, Trader Joe's uh, like so, a plaza. I, so what I'm, okay. I'm not trying to push small brick up, but what I, I think if we want to move to the brainstorming section, right, what I'm hearing is sign it, better sign it and better information to our, the larger base in terms of what is available or not available. I mean, that's two ways we can move towards a potential solution. Not saying that that is the only solution, but um, and I don't, I'm not, if we're going to stay in the larger breakout, I'm not sure I should be there. So <laughs> that's fair. I'm just going to help, you know, get everybody to speak up here. You did a great job. Well, yeah, you did fun. Yeah, you did great. One, of, one of the things that I brought, brought up with Nancy and at a different meeting is, okay, we know we have a problem and we're all concerned about it. So, what are our solutions to the problem? And we, we can complain about it all we want to do. I just want to make sure that that consideration is not only with, you know, the Williamson Day project, the Rawl project, even the projects that are coming in over by Gordon Beers, that the city make aware that we need to make sure that we're not impacted, not only with parking, but the traffic to go down Taylor to get on the freeways. But, can we resolve this problem by, can the city help by maybe covering the insurance at, you know, Wesley Methodist Church and, and maybe there's, there's a way that Wesley can make some money and people can pay for the parking on Wesley property. Is there ways to work this out? Is there a way to get parking, you know, behind John Akiyama Center? that there's other ways to develop parking on, uh, you know, in, in properties that are there. Now, part of the problem, you know, when I talked to Warren Hayashi was, can the city help Wesley because it's a church? Is that okay and not okay? You know, so and, let's, we've got and are those minutes. rules that are gonna be broken? Yeah, see, that's a great example of a solution. So why don't we do three tables and just brainstorm solutions? Like put that, let's just brainstorm solutions. Potential ideas but yeah. that would help, but, and it's going to probably be a combination. Yeah, things that, things that could help. Going to have a comment, uh, native San Jose and native California, and I traveled throughout the state very long ago. This is California. Everyone owns a view. If you're a couple, you have two. Um, if you look at the commuter traffic coming in, over 90% of the vehicles have one person in. So what makes this development think that a half a mile away to BTA or a quarter mile and a, and a half a mile to the future BART station is going to alleviate the parking. Let's do, let's take you eight here. Let's focus on solutions that you have that you're just going to put on the list that address problems that you all see. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Turn here to go there. John. Uh, John. John. I think if one of the solutions would be work with the city department of transportation to find some additional on-street parking where we're available that's all within that same walkable area that had been studied. So there's probably some additional parking spaces that can be found within that area. So I think okay, the solution is working with some more on space spaces. Yeah, okay, so that's really good. It's our floor. See, uh, on Sundays, allow us to park like we do for funerals, right down mm -hmm. the middle. Uh, Sunday, so you can use the, the, the yeah, whatever you call that. Okay, so to address the peak demand on Sundays, allow us to park down the middle like we do for funerals. Four. Okay, is there a fifth? I have to uh, build underground parking. Uh, okay, you got to pay for it somehow. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. right, right. right. Assuming right. the funds are available. Build underground parking, find money. And one more, money. And one more Six. Uh, find the uh, uh, electronic solution. Let's say uh, I have an, an application Smart that parking. tells me where the available parking is. Ah. So uh, if, you, if you build in the parking uh, 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 spaces that kind of communicates, it's yeah. available. There are cities that put sensors on every single on-street parking lot, oh, there are and then they direct, and there's apps that you can have. San Francisco has us, SF Park, so you would know a block away there's an on-street space that somebody just got out. Okay, okay, so that's six. Sorry, what? I was going to say, especially if you can categorize it as meter versus street versus... Yeah. Okay, good idea. That's and six. this is there are seven. 
Well, it also includes, you know, what I'm talking about, Wesley also includes the Washi La, John Akiyama uh, Center behind it. There's a lot of so property Akiyama, on there. So the green space, the green lot, that's, that's what you mean, right? right. The lot that's not you know, green. I mean, can we work on building parking over there? And then I don't know where else there's. Well, those are private lots. Are private lots. Are private lots. Akiyama is the Okay. okay. That's seven? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that Akiyama lot is it's city property that uh, Dwight had in Akiyama is Okay. Good clarification. We are at seven. Can I ask another question? You're going to look at that. Find a solution. <laughs> right. If, we got to get to 10. Hold it if it's the question. It's well, if, if, if that is indeed the city parking uh, property behind Akiyama Center, can you build a tall building, a tall parking unit? I mean, like a structure. A structure? If this guy has money. He's <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, it might be in a, you know, whatever foreseeable future, but is it a, a, a possible thing that we could maybe plan for? This? You'd have to finance it, right? So what did right. you say? Right. Plus, it's $40,000 a spot. to fundraise for it, I would that. Okay. okay. Is there an eight? A different idea. Eight, yeah. Where's your parking Use your parking fund. Or is it much stronger with the meter money? Yeah. The meter. Okay. Figure out how with that meter money could it be used to support parking in Japantown? You said rather than downtown. Well, the downtown association gets three hundred thousand dollars a year from the parking fund. Mm. Okay. That's eight. Good. Okay. Uh, Nine. Do you have one? Sorry. I want to make sure I get your word in. No. No. Okay. Better, park, better parking um, directions or uh, signage. signs. Better yeah. signage to help people find the parking that is available. Good. And do you have number 10? Uh, there's a lot of high density uh, occupancy buildings that charge a substantial monthly fee for parking in the building. That could be used to subsidize the subterranean or above the surface building uh, more spaces. I mean, I've seen, uh, we, I have relatives in Chicago, yeah. and they live downtown. Oh, really expensive. You know, $600 a month for yeah. a parking spot. Yeah. And it's not even near the house. Yeah. You see that in the big cities, they, they pay a lot for that one spot, so. Good. Yeah. I love it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> You know, in addition to parking spaces, is it possible to have attractive signage that says, you know, 100 feet to Roy's, you know, 200 feet to BTA, okay. or, or whatever. So, so something Wait, that honey. makes, yeah. subliminally promotes walking, maybe biking. Real street level wayfinding, mm -hmm. yes. bike yeah. finding. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, that's 11, 12. Yeah. Well, I uh, hope for that, that parking and parking supply, hopefully we get more parking supply. But um, the, the law from BTA right now isn't inviting. So oh. we don't want to think if the city can help us with that, making it more inviting, either putting in more lighting or you know, more signing, something that where people don't feel threatened, where they feel like, okay, this is a pleasant walk down to Japan. Good. Three blocks. Good. So make it more pleasant and exciting and clear to walk and feel really safe and be really safe to walk from light rail into Japan Town. Excellent. Yeah, John. This isn't a new idea, but I did see up on the uh, presentation um, of the other solutions that are not parking, but are trying to reduce the demand for parking. And maybe we could flush that out and actually under, everybody can understand that more and what's real about those, you know, the car share, the, all those other things. So it would be really nice, I think, for everybody to understand really how that would all work and what the, what the uh, benefit and impact positively those Things like what really is. Yeah, what are there, those and, you know, how they work, work what, what can they really do, and so it would not add parking, it reduces the demand for. Okay. So, so more education, so yes. we really understand what does it mean when somebody gets a free transit pass right. and they live in an apartment, like, how do they, do they really use it? Okay, that's 14, you guys, this is great. Can, can yeah. I ask a question? Is, is there a system where there is car share that you can teach, you know, um, the William and Dane project and the Rome project and each of the different housing areas like Morito Village, Mariani Square, that yeah. there's car there's share so car that share they can have meetings and maybe meet with each other, meet their neighbors and go share. And, and the project will include car share. Okay, but, but I think what you're saying is car share, is it car share? Right. How how do you educate us? You know, maybe maybe have separate meetings per each of the housing 
areas so that they can even get to know their neighbors and maybe that can help alleviate some of the yeah. uh, parking. And so car share would be available not just for the people living in the courtyard project, but it could be available to people living in the district, right? That some of the cars, like say downtown in my neighborhood, they're like right on the street. Right? So or or maybe they'll them. find out they work for the same company. Yeah. And they can, you know. Um, yeah, pedicabs. <laughs> okay, you guys, this is great. 14. Okay, Lisa. I would also say, I mean, just putting the onus on the, the residential people, but if the developer could, I'm sorry, I'm beeping, but. <laughs> But if the own, if the res, uh, developer could make it incentives to not have a car and then pay for more cars, like so, if you're above one car, you have. But I think it already came up paying for additional spaces. But if you don't have a car and you're using all these alternative transportations, you get some sort of credit or something, right. but not just a discount on the. Welfare. I, I have okay. a similar okay. suggestion. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's credit for rent. City has uh, resources, so it can create incentives for visitors. Okay, uh, uh, if you visit uh, without a car, then the Japan you get a discount. I, I don't know. Just yeah. think of some kind of. Yeah, uh, encourage uh, people to <laughs> not arrive by <laughs> car. Somebody likes that idea. Oh, oh my! my <laughs> Reduction in rent or something, if you get a car, maybe have a dollars a month cheaper or whatever. Yeah. 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 I to arrive not in their car, they're coming to the restaurant, but they're on bike or pedicab or car share or that helps everybody, right? Okay, 18, you guys, this is great. Because 18 and 300 so. like The block's are really long, so we need help from the city to allow us to put in mid-block pedestrian. To make it easier to walk. Mid-board, mid block and cross it. Make it easier to get from A to B and around. Yeah, mid-block, because we have long blocks. I think our churches are right in the middle of them, and so, you know, we have to man pedestrian, let our pedestrian walks with people, because the traffic is just super fine. Uh, okay. So okay, let's see if we get to 20. We're at 18. How, how about more bus stops in the area? More, more transit stops. stops. Through Japan. Good, good. Make it easier for people to use transit and seniors and people who right. are disabled and kids and not everybody drives, right? So give more options. Okay. okay. Get to well, uh, this is just another thought on, you know, also we're going to have a lot more traffic coming through with Rome and, and Williams and Dang and whatever project's going to come in over by uh, Gordon Bierce. Do we add another, you know, entrance onto 87? you know, off of one of the other streets. You know, right now it's on Taylor, but Taylor, and it, it takes me longer to get on the freeway than it does for me to get to the chiropractor once I get on the freeway, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, if there's, maybe we need to have more entrances to 87 in order to, to on reduce the traffic situation. Okay, so continue to work on the kind of ingress and egress. And yeah, so I would say more along the lines of, um, traffic mitigation, having the lights timed on heading, if there's a five o'clock train, everyone's getting off, it backs up all the way to the county bid, uh, buildings, or if you're going on first and you're trying to make a left, or left yeah, turn going on to like Taylor or Jackson, you can wait three or four lights because a bus or a train came through. So continue to look at it, it's related to timing, 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 signal timing, signal timing a little bit. So, so, so do you want to talk about Go through after we sort of after year end when we're actually in contact with Or we're going to go through as part of the. Why don't you say that, Chris? Yes, yeah, stand up and say that because this um, is important. Part of the, this is a long process that we're going to go through, right? We're really sort of meeting with everybody today and Saturday just to keep everybody apprised and let you know what the direction we are so that we can get under contract on the property and then move forward with the zoning. Um, so there's a long process that's part of the zoning, and part of that is, this, is our protected intersection meetings. Um, we pay fairly large fees uh, on the property that are dedicated towards us doing traffic calming and traffic improvements that are identified by the community within a budget. Um, so the things along those lines, there'll be an entire community meeting that's just talking about nothing but what, you know, sort of what are these, what are these traffic calming things that should be done by the developer within our budget. Okay. Well, this is a great suggestion, the lights and the sign. Well, yeah. even, even maybe in addition to lights, you know, even though it'll drive everybody nuts on Taylor, but God, sometimes if you're on 6th 
trying to wait to make a left is tough. You have to make sure you're on 5th or 7th at a light so you can turn left yeah. to, to go towards the freeway. Yeah. We may have to add more lights, like especially on 6th Street, yeah. and then in it's order to get through. There was about Hill trying to cross mm -hmm. not too long ago. Mm -hmm. right on oh, they got killed at 6th and Taylor because mm -hmm. there wasn't any mm -hmm. you know, traffic light. Hey, anyway, well, you guys, you have 21 ideas of things we can all look at together can and I figure out how to address this, some of this. This is just a, like another side issue, but lately Japantown's really been, you know, uh, burglarized a lot. There's been a, just a tremendous amount of theft, and, and some people have even gotten held up with guns, and it, it doesn't feel comfortable. I mean, I would love it if the city could find a way to I don't know, I know we're short of police officers, I keep saying it over and over, but we've got to find a way to also make Japantown more secure. So people feel secure to come visit, because I've even gotten emails from my friends who are Japanese American. They're saying they don't want to come because they're afraid, because their cars keep getting broken. broken. Yeah, so okay. Okay. Yeah. I need to wrap up this meeting. Is it really, really urgent? No, I just thought. Most of them have all spoken, but I know Amy hasn't said a word. Yeah, is there anybody who hasn't said anything? <laughs> Amy hasn't said a word. I have a big problem with the parking because we have no garage or parking lot. I have concreted the front so my customers could pull up right to the front of the shop. But I can't block the, the bar door, so I have that one space. My customers are getting older. There are many using walkers, kings, and wheelchairs. So I have to make it accessible for them. I have parked in the street and have had my car stolen. Oh, no. Oh, no. So oh. there is a big problem. Oh, yeah. Well, this is how communities and neighborhoods <laughs> bond and get better over time. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for your participation. Nancy, can we commit to make our list of 21 we'll ideas for Saturday. and share it around? Please come back Saturday, 10 till noon, yeah. same time, right in the same place. And we're, we're going to talk uh, about... I'll keep on screen on Saturday. Yeah, there's so much going on. <laughs> yeah, so there's, a, there's a lot going on. Saturday here, so please, please come and feel free to come in and out of the meeting. Thank you.